So, welcome to the Capturing the Rain webinar. I am Julie Bolthouse, the Fauquier Field Representative for Piedmont Environmental Council. This webinar, as Claire mentioned, is brought to you by PEC in partnership with our Northern Piedmont Community Foundation, the Cortland Fund, National Fish and Wildlife Federation, or Foundation, Chesapeake Stormwater Network, the Center for Watershed Protection, Fauquier County, Fauquier Extension, and John Marshall Soil and Water Conservation District. A big thank you to all of our presenters and thank you all, all of our members and supporters. You guys make events like this possible. Piedmont Environmental Council has been protecting the Piedmont's natural resources, rural economy, history, and beauty since 1972. We cover a nine county region ranging from Loudoun, Clark County in the north to Charlottesville and Albemarle in the south. Our role in the region is to engage, educate, and empower residents to become strong advocates. We advocate for conservation practices, better land use planning, a resilient and strong local food economy, increased public access to parks, improved water quality, and protection of wildlife habitat. Today, we are talking about stormwater, how HOAs and other owners of common areas like schools, churches, and parks can manage it. Before I get started, I would like to briefly introduce myself, Claire, and our guest speakers. I've been with PEC for about 10 years. I have a master's degree in natural resource management and urban and regional planning. Prior to my work with PEC, I did fisheries and stream work as an intern throughout Virginia. Claire Catlett joined PEC in 2017 after working in the Southwest for eight years on conservation and protection of Western rivers. She holds a master's degree in international development, sustainability, and environment from the University of Denver. David Wood has worked in the Chesapeake Bay watershed for years, working with the Chesapeake Research Consortium prior to his work with the Stormwater Network. David Hirschman has decades of experience in local government, nonprofit, private consulting, and teaching at the university level. Ari Daniels has been with the Center for Watershed Protection for six years and is a civil water resource engineer who has designed numerous stormwater BMPs. The plan for the webinar is that I'll be introducing stormwater, um, how it is managed, followed by Dave Hirschman, who will be speaking about his experiences implementing projects and tips for HOAs doing those projects, followed by Ari Daniels, who will be giving some examples of projects in Fauquier Warrington and a practical guide for making stuff happen, and David Wood, who will be speaking about residential and community best management practices. And to conclude the webinar, Claire Catlett will be leading us in question and answer. And again, if you have questions throughout this presentation or throughout the other's presentations, please send those directly to Claire Catlett in the chat box. To start with, this is green, what is green infrastructure? Well, <laughs> green infrastructure is defined by its contrast to gray infrastructure. That would be stormwater basins, culverts, and storm drains, all that hard infrastructure you see. It is the use of plant soil systems, permeable pavement, stormwater harvest and reuse uh, or landscaping to store, infiltrate, which means to absorb into the ground, or reduce flow to sewer systems and surface waters. So this slide is a little complicated, showing the details of the water cycle. But the basic things to remember are that water resources are connected. Groundwater flows into streams and provides the base flow during dry periods. All the water that falls from the sky is taken up by plants and flows into groundwater and surface waters. We all live in a watershed. Most of us on this webinar live in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. What we do on our land and in our yards impacts our local streams, rivers, and eventually the bay. Suburban development significantly changes the landscape from rural farm and forest, and it, it changes the way that water flows off the land. Water that was once absorbed by the ground and refilled groundwater and stream base flow now hits impervious surfaces like driveways, roads, rooftops, and runs off through our stormwater system. Impervious surfaces reduce the amount of vegetation and the amount of water that can infiltrate into the ground, resulting in more runoff. As you can see in this diagram, the bottom slide shows that 35 to 50% impervious surface can triple the amount of water that is running off directly into our streams through our stormwater systems. So this is a hydrograph of a stream in a rural setting prior to urbanization. 
and it, it shows the effect of increases in an impervious surface. It shows the flow of water before, during, and after a stormwater event. The three key aspects of the graph are first, time to peak. This is the length of time it takes after a storm or a rain event for the water level to peak. The peak flow is the maximum flow or the height of floodwaters from a storm event. And the base flow is the average flow of a stream between rainwater events or the flow that is normally in the stream. The blue line on this graph is an example of a stream in an urban setting, surrounded by roads, buildings, and parking lots, et cetera. It demonstrates how urbanization impacts the three key aspects I just mentioned. The increase, increased runoff of stormwater results in reduced time to peak. So you can see this peaks in a shorter duration than the rural or um, forest stream. A higher peak flow or higher floodwaters and reduced base, base flow during times without rain because groundwater levels are lower and unable to replenish the streams. The effect of urbanization on water quality varies based on what land use is being developed with forest cover conversion showing the most stark increase in pollutant levels. Some of the pollutants you can expect to see are higher bacterial counts such as fecal coliform and um, E. coli. Increased chemicals such as chloride from de-icing of roads, septic systems, water softeners, and pools. Increased trace metals such as lead, mercury, and arsenic. Oil and gasoline contaminants off of roads and parking lots. And increased pesticides and herbicides from golf courses, lawns, and gardens. You can also expect to see excess nutrients from septic systems and fertilizers used on golf courses, lawns, and gardens. And finally, increased water temperatures in streams from lack of trees and plants providing shade along streams, shallower water from reduced base flows that I mentioned earlier, and the absorption of heat from impervious surfaces as stormwater runs off. Oops, sorry, I've got a little delay, hold on. There it goes. The traditional way of handling stormwater runoff is to get it out as fast as possible. We do this to protect our buildings and roadways from flooding. But we re we've realized that this method causes problems downstream as population and urbanization increases. Every stream is connected downstream to, a large, to larger water bodies and usually another community. This system was built to direct runoff from the development you see in the background to a local stream. The local stream then drains into a larger stream called the Tuscarora Creek, which drains into the Potomac River. And of course, the Potomac River drains into the Chesapeake Bay. The new way of handling stormwater runoff is to let the water slow down, spread out, and sink in, while of course still protecting our buildings and roadways from flooding. This picture is actually a stream restoration project on the Tuscarora just downstream from the first picture I showed. The trees planted help slow down water flow. The once narrow channelized stream bed has been widened to allow water to spread out into a wider floodplain where water can have more time to sink in. The goal of the project is to reduce flooding of the adjoining uh, properties that you can see in the background and enhance the natural stream channel and floodplain that had become badly eroded over the years. The wider floodplain gives the stream more capacity to handle floodwaters, and the planted riparian buffer allows the stream to help slow down flow and improves the stream habitat. So here are a couple local examples of green infrastructure projects that help implement this new way of handling stormwater. This is a picture of the rainwater swales at the Piedmont Environmental Council office in Warrington. In 2015, we replaced our mowed lawn backyard that included some steep slopes with a large native plant garden and these swales to capture rainwater runoff. The swales were partially funded by the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, also known as VCAP, which is available through your local soil and water conservation district in Virginia. The rest of the garden was funded through private donations. The way the swales work is that runoff from our office and driveway is guided to a series of rainwater swales with engineered soils 
that are designed to slow down and allow the water to be absorbed by the surrounding ground and plants. The plants used in the swale are adapted to wet conditions and were specifically selected to reduce turbidity and increase the infiltration rates. Another great example is this 300 square foot rain garden at the number 18 schoolhouse in Marshall completed by the Fauquier Master Gardeners in 2019. It was also partially funded through the VCAP program. It replaces a poorly functioning grassy swale that captures rainwater from the schoolhouse roof and some of the water from a nearby transfer station. This is the site working its magic after a rain event. Both the Larson Native Plant Garden and the number 18 schoolhouse rain garden are demonstration gardens and are open to the public. So if you're ever in Fauquier County or if you live in Fauquier County, we encourage you to come and visit one or both of these. The key takeaways are that excessive storm water runoff results in flooding, ecological damage, and pollution downstream. While utilizing the water on site reduces runoff, improves water quality, and enhances the beauty of your common area. The small actions that we take in our common areas or even our own backyards if we can't, if we can't get um, our HOA on board can make a huge difference. And remember, you can always start small and build upon that. So with that, I'd like to start um, to let, like to turn the webinar over to our next speaker, Dave Hirschman, to hear about some examples of projects he's been working on and tips for HOAs trying to complete a green infrastructure project in their common area. So David Hirschman, turn it over to you. All right, can you see my slide and hear me okay? Yes. All well, right. I can't see your slides yet. I can just see you. Oh, you can't see the slide yet. Okay, well, let's try that again. Share. There it's going. Okay. This kind of, this view kind of gives away the there we go. Is that good, everybody? Yep. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you to Piedmont Environmental Council and Julia and her colleagues for hosting this webinar. And I am uh, delighted to be a part of it and to share some quick examples, kind of set the table, prime the pump, and uh, build some enthusiasm for Ari and David, who will speak after this, and go into a few more details. But I am David Hirschman. I have a small environmental company in Charlottesville, Virginia. So kind of covering the, the southern part of the PEC service area. Uh, we all in Virginia, we know we are, are for lovers, but what our group is trying to do is make sure we're also for BMP lovers, which BMP standing for best management practice. Those are the types of practices that Julie talked about and we will talk about during this webinar today. Just to clarify a little bit about something that Julie mentioned, which is this cost share program for the types of practices that we're gonna present, uh, mostly small practices. This is a Virginia program uh, that provides incentives and cost share for homeowners and small businesses and so forth to install these practices and on the right, they, they have a design manual. So there's actually some guidance on how to design the practices in order to qualify for the cost share funds. I'm gonna show a few very quick examples of these different types of applications of green infrastructure for stormwater, residential house of worship, small scale commercial and stormwater basin. And I know that Ari and David will be kind of picking up some of these threads as we move through the program today. But I think in application for homeowners associations, all of these different types of applications are probably relevant for the, the drainage and stormwater issues that HOAs are dealing with. So we'll start with a residential project. And you will see on each of my slides, I'm presenting below who the partners are. And one of the lessons is that to have a successful green infrastructure project, partners and collaborations are probably the most important element. So you will see, I'm not gonna go through, but uh, who 
they are for each project, but you'll see there's uh, designers, there's landscape contractors, contractors, nonprofits, all kinds of different people involved. So here are the, uh, this is the residential project, and this is prior to the installation of the practice, and there was, a, uh, you can see the land slopes down from the road towards the property, and during storms like we got last night, there was basically a stream coming out of here, hidden, held down that hill, and basically carving a little channel down here, dangerously close to this homeowner's front door, which nobody wants to live with a situation like that. Looking back across the street, the neighbor across the street uh, paved an expanded driveway. You can see there's runoff from the road. So this particular owner was getting a lot of runoff not so much from their own property, but from surrounding areas and hard surfaces such as roads, rooftops, and driveways. So we had to kind of devise a way to convey the water. The city public works department was uh, lined up to help by putting in a curb, but the issue was the curb was gonna have a curb cut that was gonna concentrate the flow of water on this homeowner's property. So we had to devise a system to convey and treat the water. And you can see this is what we came up with. It's under construction. There's a rock channel and a little rain garden here. And this is during the construction process. Here you can see the curb cut in the street. And this is the brand new curb that the city installed, but basically concentrated and punched all this water right into a concentrated area. So this is the flow path that we had to design in order to manage this extra flow of water at that one point. And you can kind of see the rain garden in the background right here. Here it is also during construction right after a storm and you can see the rain garden collecting some water. Uh, and this is more or less the finished product uh, as of last year. So the homeowner was pretty happy with it. And the only thing I would like to say about this in terms of the ability to educate other people about these types of practices is according to the homeowner, everybody that walks by walking their dog or baby stroller or just taking a walk, they look at this and, and ask if he's in the yard, what is that? How does it work? It's really interesting. And so once these things are installed in a neighborhood, just by word of mouth, they tend to sell themselves, which is kind of an interesting feature. Uh, funding for this project was from the property owner as well as a little bit uh, from VCAP and the total cost of this was 9600 So I'm going to put costs because everybody out there who wants to implement a project always wants to know how much is it going to cost. So each of these will cover that. House of Worship is the next one. You can see here one of the partners was the Rivana Conservation Alliance, which is my watershed organization where I live in the Rivanna River watershed and I've done a lot of projects with them and they do excellent work implementing green infrastructure. This was a church and uh, basically it was uncontrolled runoff from the church parking lot carving out a ditch that was you can see it right here concentrated down through the parking lot going right out into the road and directly into a storm drain which is kind of the situation that Julie was talking about with the hydrographs, making things worse. Uh, fortunately, they had this big grassy area, so we decided to divert the parking lot and the roof water to this open area that they had in the churchyard. And you can kind of see here, excavating the bioretention area in that area. And here we are with the mulch. This is uh, during a storm. It's kind of a two-tiered system with this bioretention treating the parking lot and then overflowing to this one as a backup, but also this lower one treating the, the rooftop. And you can see the downspout right there. And here is the product after being planted. Uh, some people might say, man, that looks pretty shaggy. But this was a very interesting planting design. It was uh, done by the Center for Urban Habitats, which is based here in Charlottesville, and they use uh, natural plant communities. So it's not just native plants, but it's native plants that grow together 
in assemblages of natural plant communities. And in this case, they modeled a, that type of community uh, down on the floodplain of the Rivanna River, and we replicated that plant community in these bioretention areas. And it's been wonderful to work with the church. Uh, they see this as part of their stewardship mission, and it's been very gratifying. Uh, funding for this, uh, there was a grant that the Rivanna Conservation Alliance had, and we supplemented that with VCAP. The total cost was 20000 with the VCAP grant amounting to just about half of that amount. Moving on to another project also involving Rivanna Conservation, which is a small-scale commercial. This was actually the Rivanna Conservation Alliance office, which they recently moved to River Road, fittingly enough. This is their office where the star is, and it's basically literally a stone's throw to the river. And they wanted to be down in this area, but the existing area was very industrial, lots of past uh, contractor storage yards and all kinds of different industrial activities. So it was prohibitive to actually dig into the ground because we didn't know if, if we'd find chemicals or storage tanks. They wanted to treat the water, but they needed to do it above ground. So we devised a system of stormwater planters. Uh, you can Lisa here from the Ravana Conservation Alliance. And these things are basically a rain garden in a box. You can see on the right, we're installing a gravel under drain system there. I filled it up. This is um, Mary from our local soil and water district here doing the VCAP inspection. And you can kind of see how we diverted the downspouts from the building into these planter boxes, as what we call stormwater planter. And this is as of last year during the growing season. And this was just a couple of weeks ago. And it was delightful to see the, the irises blooming in there and the, the plants really taking off in the second growing season. This was also VCAP funded, so you keep seeing that. Um, we basically, it's a very affordable project. It was about 12,000 with VCAP covering about 9,000 of that and other RCA funding and grants covering the rest. Finally, um, I'm gonna talk about a project which we recently just completed, and it's a stormwater basin. And I thought this might be relevant for the homeowners associations, many of which do have a basin, which maybe isn't in great shape or they're thinking, what is this thing? It's kind of more of a nuisance than an asset. And so there's a movement to sort of uh, retrofit these basins and, and David Wood's gonna talk more about this. But this is the basin. This is, it could have been in a homeowners association. This one happens to be at a school. And this is, we're just starting construction here, but one of the things you see is all this clay. A lot of these basins were graded and compacted. And this one had a bunch of clay that was sealing up the basin, meaning that water couldn't soak into the ground. Um, and that was because of that layer of compacted clay. But by doing some soil tests, we found that below about one foot of compacted clay, there was a better soil lens that would be better at putting the water into the surrounding soil and the landscape. So it was a very simple uh, retrofit, and David's gonna talk more about retrofits. These can get complicated and they can get expensive when you're going into an existing stormwater pond. So we kind of wanted to demonstrate um, a simpler, maybe more cost-effective approach. You can see the big parking lot here, which is being treated by this basin. And here we excavated all that nasty clay and put in more of a sandy loam soil. Uh, we had about six inches of rain. If you were around Virginia or the mid-Atlantic this past spring, we got some uh, one storm after another. So we were just in the middle of construction and we got four inches and it just kept raining. So that's always a challenge, but we worked through it. And here it is, I think just last week, we again used a lot of native plants and you can see uh, what we call coconut fiber matting. Um, and this is really coming along as a more naturalized stormwater basin. Funding for this, again, was National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant, which 
was to the Rivanna Conservation Alliance. And I'm not sure about the total cost, but approximately 20,000. And that might look like a big number to you HOAs out there, but you can, some of the other basin retrofits can easily be 100 to 200,000. So uh, maybe in relative terms, it's a cheaper one. All right, Julie, how are we doing on time? I think you're fine, go ahead. Okay, just two more slides here. The first one, and the, uh, the PEC folks wanted me to cover some tips and a little bit of the process for HOAs. And we can double back to this stuff uh, in the Q&A later on. But as I said, partnerships and collaborations is probably the most important tip. Uh, it's hard to do this stuff alone. There's certain, like a watershed organization has access to grants that an HOA may not have access to. Identify clear design objectives. What are you trying to do? And nail that down very concisely. And so, because otherwise you don't really know what you're trying to achieve. Okay, so we're gonna talk about long-term maintenance. Um, you can design something that by the design features that you put in become a very high maintenance obligation. Or you can do the opposite, make design choices right from the beginning that reduce long-term maintenance. So that is definitely something to think about at the very beginning of a project. Uh, there's training available. The CBLP stands for Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional, which we'll probably talk about, but that's a certification. Uh, certainly available to HOAs or landscape contractors, anybody interested in getting a better foundation of green infrastructure. Um, finally, be patient. That's maybe the most important one. You might think that, oh, you know, from the twinkle in your eye of what we might do to completion, it might be a year. Uh, but generally these projects take two, maybe three years really to get all the way through the process. Um, and speaking of process, a little bit on that. Um, basically know what you're starting with. Are there common areas? What do the property deeds say? A lot of common areas and HOAs may have utilities. Are there easements in there? So basically get a good read from the legal documents of what you have to begin with. Um, look at your basic existing maintenance protocols. Maybe there's contracts that are already out there for maintenance. Um, who is your team? Is there a maintenance committee or chair? Sometimes they may love mowing. And so there's an internal education process to go through. Uh, build partnerships, look at the grants, build support. I mean, some people look at these things if they don't understand what it's for, that it's for water quality, it's for the stream, it's for habitat. They might be against the project. I showed that, that, that one at the church, which is um, kind of using natural plant communities, but people have to be educated on the benefits of that before they accept it as something, as an improvement in the neighborhood. And then obviously, if you implement it, you also have to maintain it. Julie, I believe that is my last slide. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're going to go ahead and introduce um, Ari Daniels now. Uh, you can go ahead with your presentation. All right, thank you. Um, I was unaware of the whole chat structure for this particular presentation, so there are a couple things that I was going to do and I'm not going to do, but anyway, uh, I'm Ari Daniels. I'm a water resources engineer for the Center for Watershed Protection. I will skip all the intros about what I do, what I've done, what we do, et cetera. Just check us out at cwp.org. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out. Thank you so much to the, the PEC folks for organizing this. It has been awesome. Uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation for funding a lot of the work uh, and some of the stuff that I'm going to touch and, and my sort of presence in this uh, presentation here. Uh, I'm going to present a couple example projects in Fauquier and Warrington uh, and a little bit beyond that, uh, but mostly I'm going to try to run through some resources that uh, I'm proud of uh, and will give what I can on both the resources and just some lessons learned for actually making stuff happen and to the extent possible sort of under radars. Um, I'll explain more about that. It, it's not as shady as it sounds. Uh, 
quick outline. Uh, so example projects, uh, some tips for getting help, uh, either in the form of money and or people power, uh, and a very quick walk through really super thick resources that uh, are navigable once you get to them, uh, but are big when you look at them from a distance. Uh, the little unicorn in the bottom right corner, like I said, this was going to be a little bit of a game. Uh, we're big in gamification these days. Are we going to be points for finding the Easter eggs I left in slides? But since you can't actually chat to everybody, never mind. So just keep your eye peeled. Maybe it'll be fun for you. All right. So Warrington Dog Park. Even open space can be an opportunity for some kind of a stormwater retrofit. The bottom right picture is sort of standing at the dog park in Warrington looking north-ish. Uh, along this grassy area here. And this turf grass right here, or fescue, uh, is generally kind of the lowest value vegetative cover there is. It's not impervious cover, so it's better than that, but it's got really short roots, uh, doesn't do much to foster infiltration, doesn't do an awful lot to attenuate flow, takes a bunch of, uh, there's a lot of time, energy, and money, and carbon involved in maintaining it. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd say raise your hand. Raise your hand if you hate mowing. Um, anyway, we have designed a, a couple of bioretentions, which are essentially just deeper rain gardens. It's a rain garden, and then down below, there's some stone space and an underdrain so that any water that makes it all the way through, if there isn't a lot of infiltration happening at that moment, it can enter filtered through a pipe into whatever it is. And here, it would be the adjacent stream. There's a little tributary next to that. Um, different opportunity and not so much for HOAs, although you may have an outfall like this near where you are. Um, there is now a Chesapeake Bay program specific crediting protocol for repairing outfalls that are kind of like this. Uh, and so there is now a lot of incentive for uh, municipalities or, you know, whoever the the, the, the owner is for repairing outfalls that are eroding like this up at the, the top two pictures, what I'm talking about here. Um, I, this isn't actually me wearing this t-shirt. I just decided to design this for fun. F forget. It's a much nicer F word than I usually use. Uh, I've got a lot of grass out here to maintain. Again, if there's anything that you can do to replace fescue or turf grass with native plants, something else, chances are one, it's going to lower your maintenance input, and two, it's going to be much better for the environment uh, and the hydrology. Speaking of turf grass, uh, a design that we have done and permitted and are going to be constructing very soon uh, this summer is over at Brumfield Elementary School. Uh, there is about 11 acres or so of drainage area that drains to this ditch that you see in the left picture, just runs right along Allwington Boulevard into this unnamed tributary out to, I think, Turkey Run, bypassing this huge space that, as you can tell from these stripes, is basically just used as grass to be mowed. So we are going to replace this with a constructed wetland, which is going to give uh, a, a good chance for detention time. Uh, the, the water is going to have a chance to get cleaned by the natural biological and chemical processes. And hopefully sometime next year, this is going to be a beautiful wetland and again, an educational opportunity. Uh, it's right at the entrance of Brumfield Elementary and like a stone's throw, literally, if you've got an arm better than mine from Taylor Middle School and a community center. Now, this one is not in Warrenton or Fauquier, but this one is a nice example, uh, offered way too many lessons learned, uh, but it's also of a size and scale eventually for the work that was done, uh, that it can be even individual residential, it can be an HOA, light commercial, something like that. So Akakik First Church of God in, you guessed it, Akakik, Maryland. Uh, they were the grantee under a Chesapeake Bay Trust grant. Uh, CBT does a lot of stuff, so you know, keep, keep that in your in your toolbox. Uh, Prince George's County was the, uh, the sort of the source of the funds and the permitting agency. This design went through a bunch of iterations and uh, I'm just going to leave you with a phrase that I coined, death by checklist. Uh, we went from a wet swale to a grass swale to an infiltration trench. We constructed an infiltration trench. We <laughs> Uh, it failed. We constructed an abandoned infiltration trench. That failed, which is what you're looking at right here, why all of this sod was drowned and killed. Uh, and eventually this became a rain garden because that's what was, that's what we were left with by the process of elimination. Um, Easter eggs in this one, alligator in the ponded area and a little snake in the shadow of the sod. I went out to repair this at the very end, basically had to do some grading was going to try to knock down the lower, that's up at the top right portion of this, so that the water could actually drain out, was going to put in some plants that were sort of suitable for the range of 
water conditions here, which would be too little or too much, depending on a lot of factors. This is as far as I got digging in the clay. It is incredibly dense and incredibly heavy, and I'm not quite the man I was when I was half my current age. Um, that's as far as I got before I decided to bring in the power tools. Um, so apart from the truck, which someone hopefully has, if you end up needing to do something with machinery, uh, the cost can be really, really uh, approachable. Uh, so the dump trailer and the mini excavator I rented for the day ran right around $500 or so. Uh, it's an incredibly accessible and manageable level of power for a lot of people. You will spend the first half hour, hour or so getting used to figuring out which direction the joystick moves to make what kind of thing happen for the bucket. Oops. Sorry. Wrong key. Um, and anyway, it can also be a lot of fun. Uh, be aware there's some regulations you'll need to, to play around with, but um, I enjoyed this. Pictures where it didn't happen. This is right at the start of the work. Uh, my whole purpose was basically just to knock down the grade here, just to take about six, maybe nine, uh, in places possibly 12 inches of soil out of here, just to let the water have a path out. Uh, was basically just digging from here, swinging around, dropping it in the dump trailer, and then 10 minutes down the road was a landfill. Uh, and got done in a day what probably would have taken me three or four and uh, an awful lot of um, pain. <laughs> uh, Easter egg in that one, picture of an excavator on the side of the excavator. This is what it looked like before I completely finished with the plant layout. Uh, thanks to Chesapeake Natives, uh, I purchased these plants from them. They uh, are a, a range of sort of suitable plants that are very tolerant to, you know, hydrologic conditions all the way from drought to inundation or flooding. Uh, there are a bunch of grasses and sedges in here. Uh, these are all local phenotype natives um, and hopefully should have some color at different times throughout the year. There are probably a half a dozen different flowering plants in there as well. And Easter egg in that one is a potted plant. This is what it looked like fully laid out. And you can kind of tell by the lighting of the picture. This is the end of the day. I managed to get it done just in time. Uh, installed all of the plants, uh, the ones that are sort of low or the ones that are more tolerant of inundation around the edges, the ones that are going to be happy with less water. These flags are just here to keep the person who mows the lawn from just riding through this area and cutting stuff up. You put in all this effort, you don't want people to hack down all the plants. Uh, and you'll see the sprinkler, it's important to get them established. I didn't know what the rain would be like, uh, so it was worth investing whatever. 30 bucks in the sprinkler to make sure that this thing had uh, the best sort of kickstart that it could. And everything, to Dave's point, needs some maintenance. This solo cup is not an Easter egg in this slide. This is just trash. Um, this particular spot probably takes a little bit more of an eye. And uh, all of this grass right here, most of this stuff around the side, this is actually just, again, that same sort of turf grass and some slightly wilder grasses that have gotten out of control. Uh, and I'm guessing this bunch right here, and there are a couple of these other little clumps or probably plants that I put in here, but a lot of this stuff needs to be cut carefully by hand while the plants that I put in here on purpose get a chance to really get established uh, because grass can and will outcompete other things if not kept in check. All right, quick tips. Uh, starting out, if you want to try to take on some projects where you are and this isn't something that you can do solo or want to do solo or you want some guidance, highly recommended. Uh, Folks like Dave, both Dave and David have tons and tons of experience. They are incredibly valuable resources to the extent they can be if they have the time. Uh, your local soil and water conservation district, uh, depending on where you are, I'm actually one of the directors out in my district, but we're in such a rural area that we don't do any of this, like there's no such thing as an HOA out here. Um, but your local soil conservation district or soil and water conservation district, your local government, those are gonna be closely tied. Your local watershed association or nonprofit like CSN, PEC, CWP, uh, pick a three-letter initialization, probably describes a watershed organization. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals at cblpro.org, great, great resource uh, that is fairly young, uh, but highly recommended. Again, if you can replace Vesky with something more valuable, please do it. And now there's all sorts of assistance, uh, in, including funding to do it. Uh, and 
when in doubt, you're like, hey, I think uh, I think Jennifer knows a bunch about this hippie stuff. Ask Jennifer or whoever it is in, in your circle, your sphere. And if you're kicking around online trying to find the local watershed association or whatever, the terms on the right, this is a very, very small sampling, but this may get you started uh, and may kick you to uh, an appropriate local organization that can probably provide you further guidance, but may be able to just directly help you. I'm not going to spend any time on this. Uh, VCAP has been mentioned. It'll be mentioned again. Uh, big thing to take away, VCAP's funding was cut in half from this past year to this year. So use it to the extent possible. And if and when you can't use it, advocate for it. It's a great program. Um, CCAP was just the Charlottesville version. I don't know if it still exists or, or what's going on with that. But anyway, uh, if you want it, make it known that you want it. Be the squeaky wheel. Uh, not going to read this, but general rules for BMP design installation and maintenance, uh, water is lazy and powerful, flows downhill, follows the path of least resistance. If you wander into the regulation territory, then the regulations and specifications differ a lot by locality and there are over 1800, or excuse me, just shy of 1800 in the Chesapeake Bay. So what you call a rain garden may not be what somebody else calls a rain garden. Maintenance and repair, I've mentioned it, it'll be mentioned again, incredibly important. It's something to think about. and. It's also altogether possible that removing turf grass and installing something else will be better for your time and energy and effort in maintenance. Um, get help. It's out there and there are a lot of people that are eager to help. Seriously, contact me. My contact is in, info is what's now gone, but I'm sure it'll be available. Ari Daniels, CWP, uh, and I'm sure the other folks here are, are happy to be uh, a first point of contact. Reach out. Uh, we, we love nothing more than seeing stuff happen. Uh, and every little bit counts. Uh, I, I phrase this often, I've, I've heard the, I don't know if it's a joke as much as it is a little piece of wisdom, how do you eat an elephant? Um, was going to be an Easter egg? The answer is one bite at a time. Um, or please don't, because why would you eat an elephant? But uh, even a tiny little conservation landscape still helps the overall quality of the bay, your local streams, etc. And 20 gallons out of 51 billion, it may seem insignificant, but every piece counts. All right, on to the resources. So this, Dave Hirschman has a bunch of, a bunch of sweat and energy in this. Um, we've got a bunch of time and energy in this. Uh, so I think Shereen Hughes is on this. So shout out to Shereen, hey. Uh, the Anne Arundel Watershed Stewards Academy uh, under a grant from NIFWIF uh, and uh, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, uh, a bunch of partners uh, had us put together this incredible, incredible manual. So the, the WSA Rainscaping Manual uh, is a 108 page, just awesome, awesome resource. Uh, covers six fairly common BMPs and site assessment and soil assessment with the details that you would hope and expect from true subject matter experts and in a digestible format uh, from what you would expect from a true graphic designer. And so shout out to Kim, I can't remember the name of her business, but she, she's in here somewhere. The field guide, the little third item on here, this is a quick reference guide it is the exact same six practices plus site and soil assessment, but two pages on each of them. So it's just a, a quick and easy thing you can carry out in the field. You know, you're doing a conservation landscape, you print out two sheets. Um, and the conservation landscape design tool is one in the middle, fantastic piece. This is a collaboration, again, you know, same group of people that put together manuals and stuff, also brought in a landscape architect and you, you basically walk through sort of a menu tree. Essentially, you say, okay, I've got about 120 square feet to work with. Uh, I've got a really sunny spot. Uh, it's pretty wet when it rains. And I'm looking for simple kind of meadow style or flowering plants or a, a woody screen for some trees uh, along the, you know, the sidewalk or something like that. And it will spit out a template, including uh, a plant palette for you to select from. There are also additional resources in, in the guidance stuff here on uh, WSA's site that can point you to other things if you want to do a little bit more personal research on what kinds of plants, find an expert uh, like the Center for Urban Habitats in Charlottesville uh, or any of the Chesapeake Bay landscape professionals uh, and a fantastic little tool. And I'll show an example of what comes out of that. Oh, and this little thing down bottom left, don't forget tree planting. It's not one of the practices in here, but that's becoming more and more uh, widely recognized as a decidedly tangibly valuable practice. Um, and there are actually even ways to get, you know, incentives and financial help to, to get trees in. And they are vastly underrated, less and less so now, which is great. Um, these are the six practices on the site and soil assessment. Uh, 
I won't read these all off, but just to give an idea of sort of where they might be useful. Um, we were proud of our graphics. They were wonderful. Each practice chapter covers the complexity of each of these practices, the location and feasibility that is appropriate for them, uh, the actual design of them, the materials that you will need and use, plants that will go in, the construction steps, maintenance required, resources, and I will qualify and say that the resources are, because this is for the Anne Arundel Watershed Stewards Academy, this is a lot of the resources are specific to that geographic area, so Baltimore-ish area or the, the DMV area, but a lot of them are nationwide, uh, and a lot of them will give you ideas uh, for uh, similar bodies or entities that are in your area. Um, and of course, if you want, you know, reach out to somebody in Anne Arundel and say, hey, who do you know up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania? And there's a thoroughly decent chance just based on the way the watershed community is built uh, that they know somebody and can at least kick you one or two steps closer to your eventual destination. So won't we'll go into the rest of the content on this slide, but there is a ton of useful information in that manual. And it's just one of many resources, but one that I'm proud of. Um, also, uh, today's point, everybody wants to know cost. Um, little picture down here, time is money. So the more time you can put in, the less money that will be sort of directly on an accounting sheet. Now your time is valuable probably, so just be aware that if you put in a bunch of time, it might cost you a few dollars, but if it cost you three months, it might've been more sensible to pay for it. But for example, conservation landscapes, this five to $20 per square foot, that 20 bucks a square foot, that is high. That's you getting a high dollar, super experienced professional to come in and do everything for you from the start to finish. But if you do it yourself, you might get this down to $3 a square foot or something like that, which is a much, much more palatable thing, especially if you're doing a large area. Um, Sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt your presentation. Go for it. Just no, no, wanna, um, make sure we have enough time for questions and answers. So try to wrap it up. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. Just mentally working through this. Uh, you can do a bunch yourself and it is amazing with really simple tools what you can do yourself. Um, you're looking at about $200 worth of tools all told. And if you've got the time and, and the back that will cooperate, you can get an awful lot done with just that. Um, limit of disturbance note, that's just, if you keep a practice small enough, you can keep from having to actually get it permitted, which can be a huge benefit to you. So find out where that threshold is for you locally and see if you can stay under it. It's possible that a 4,900 square foot work area is infinitely better than a 5,100 square foot work area because of the permitting constraints. Um, these two pages are just an example. This is the conservation landscape portion of that quick reference guide. It's a, a, it is a big, big distillation, but there's still plenty of beautiful, useful information there. It's just a good thing to have on hand when you're out in the field. The site assessment, it's the same thing. There's a ton more information than two pages in the manual, but again, quick guide, especially if you've worked through it, read through it, there's a lot to consider. And again, true subject matter experts put together an awful lot of thought and effort, um, but great resource. Uh, and as far as the soil testing, same thing. You can cover an awful lot with just, uh, you know, a shovel and a little bit of water. Um, if you need to go a step beyond what you think you can do yourself, an AOSE, Authorized Onsite Soil Evaluator, maybe, uh, you know, that, that one next step, somebody can come in and give you a lot of useful information about it. These are examples of those layouts, the templates that come from the Conservation Landscape Design Tool. Um, I'll, I'll just suggest that you go and kick around on WSA's site because there's, there's a lot there. Uh, Easter egg in that picture was an Easter egg. And quick shout out to rainwater harvesting, which gets, I don't know, I feel like it gets a little bit less attention than it should just in my circle, but that doesn't mean that it does in yours. Every little bit counts again. So even a 55 gallon rain barrel is a it is a help. I'm not going to say it's a big help, but it is a help. It is a tangible help. It, it helps sort of flatten that curve. Now we've learned this term in a different way, the hydrograph. Um, any rainwater that you can hold and then slowly release is a huge benefit to our waterways and the overall water quality. So uh, with that, thanks for showing up and spending a little bit of time learning how it is you might be taking that first bite or an additional bite of the elephant. Cheers. Great job, Ari. That was um, a lot of information and 
want to give a, a quick reference that everything Ari is presenting as well as Dave and our next presenter is going to be on our resources page following this event. All right, David Wood, would you like to start your next presentation? Sure. Can you hear me all right? And see me all right? Okay, great. So I'm going to be wrapping things up here talking about some best management practices that are residential, but they're easily scalable to an HOA or community scale. Um, so just sort of by way of a, a quick introduction, I'm with the Chesapeake Stormwater Network. We're a small nonprofit organization. We have all kinds of resources related to stormwater management. Um, you can sign up uh, to be a member of our network. It's free to do. You get access to all kinds of resources. One email a month, that's it. Um, so I encourage you to do that and you can get a lot more info. Um, I'm gonna start small, um, looking at stewardship practices um, beyond just the infiltration, sort of some of the physical practices, but some other um, programs and just uh, good stewardship behaviors that you can practice in your own yard as well as in your community. Um, for folks who want to dream a little bit bigger, I'm going to be talking about uh, briefly those stormwater pond or stormwater detention basin retrofits um, that Dave Hirschman alluded to earlier. And then I'll just wrap up with um, we call it a suburban watershed ethic at CSN. Just a couple of quick things that you can kind of keep in mind uh, on a very personal level um, to make an impact in your community. So the homeowner uh, best management practices that we um, look at a lot, there's sort of eight that we like to group together into this category. And there are things like rain gardens that you've heard a decent bit about, um, to rainwater harvesting, disconnecting your downspouts, but it also includes things like urban nutrient management, uh, managing the fertilizers, and the, the grass that does still remain in your yard and in your community because it's not very realistic to expect that you all uh, get rid of all of your grass in your communities. Um, where, what you can do with tree planting, just removing impervious cover, um, replacing it with better amended soils um, as well as conservation landscaping. Um, so I'll start with sort of what we call the retrofits. And these are the renovations that we're looking at um, treating stormwater runoff that was previously either untreated or poorly treated. Um, in your home or in your community. So I apologize that the resolution of this graphic isn't great, um, but we've talked a lot about rain gardens and I, I just wanna take a quick step backwards to sort of how they actually work um, when you go to put those in the ground. And so you have your water um, that is flowing off of your impervious surface area, your hard, your hard uh, pavement, your driveway, your rooftop, um, and it goes into this depression. Um, you've pulled out those clay soils that you know Dave mentioned that can really cause you problems, You've replaced them with a mixture of things like sand um, and your topsoil, the really healthy soil, so that that water soaks into the ground a lot easier. You also leave that little bit of a depression on top, that ponding depth of six to 12 inches, um, that you're uh, able to sort of hold that water, a little bit more water so that it can get into the ground um, over maybe a day or so, um, rather than running off and creating erosion in your yard or in your stream. It's really easy to get started if you're interested in putting a rain garden in. Uh, they can be a relatively inexpensive practice depending on the size of the area that you're trying to install. So you can do these in your yard. Um, you can also do larger bioretention scale retrofits um, in your community or your homeowners association uh, public spaces. But you can kind of be a downspout detective. So look at where the water is running off of your driveways or your roof. Um, the two photos at the top are prime uh, opportunities to put in a rain garden. You've got your downspout coming down, um, draining directly to uh, a good sized grassy area, um, which is a great location where you can, you know, dig out that depression, create your rain garden area um, to try to infiltrate some of that water rather than shooting it straight down into the street um, just below the house. Uh, the photo on the bottom is probably a better candidate, um, certainly for something like rainwater harvesting, um, like a, a rain barrel, uh, because you don't have that uh, area to dig in. Um, but you can also do something like Dave Hirschman mentioned in his presentation. Um, get a little bit creative. Look at ideas like a rain garden in a box, something that's elevated. It still lets you kind of capture and slowly release that um, water that maybe provides the aesthetic benefits as well. We do have tools. Uh, if you are, like me, a little rough uh, around the edges when it comes to your math skills, so if you are interested in designing um, and putting in your own rain garden, it is something that you can do. Uh, on your own with the help of a few tools that we have. Um, we do have a calculator tool at CSN um, where you can put in information about the size of your parking lot area or your uh, rooftop, and it'll tell you exactly the size that you need for your rain garden. 
Um, it'll also help you calculate how much sand do I need to bring in to sort of amend my soil so that it drains better. Um, do I need to have water coming in from multiple different locations to sort of spread it out so it's not this fire hydrant um, coming into my rain garden causing problems? Um, things like that. How deep do I need to dig? All of that information is in this calculator tool. Um, so it, it makes it a little bit more accessible for you. And Dave mentioned it a bunch of times and it came up in Ari's presentation as well, but don't forget about maintenance when you're doing these types of installations. Rain gardens are um, easier than grass in certain ways when it comes to maintenance, uh, but you do have to know a little bit about what you're looking for. If you don't design with maintenance in mind, um, you can have problems, whether it's just, uh, you know, you might have a sinkhole or something like that, or an animal digging in your garden that just makes it look unsightly. Um, the top right hand picture, uh, you had a, a whole bunch of erosion just upstream of your uh, rain garden. And so all of this dirt came rushing down into the bed and it clogged it up with this really fine grain dirt, keeping it from being able to infiltrate the way that it's supposed to. Um, the photo on the bottom left, uh, the way that the curb was designed, the water couldn't actually get into the rain garden. So you see all that dirt that's staining uh, the outside of the, the parking lot area. Um, basically, the way that it was designed, no water was getting into the rain garden. It was all stopping and, and being deposited uh, in, the, in the parking lot. So it's not actually doing you any good. Um, so some of those are easy fixes. Some of them you might need to bring in a partner or an expert to help you decide. And then, of course, you don't want to get lost in your rain garden either. So make sure that you're uh, trimming it, removing invasive species and things like that. So shifting gears a little bit from retrofits, uh, bay-friendly lawn care. Lawn care is an important part of uh, good stewardship. It can make a huge difference. It makes up a huge portion of your property. And we know that you're not, you're not going to convert all of it into rain gardens, um, you know, as much as we would love it to all look like meadows and things like that. Um, it's really important to, to talk about lawn care. Um, so in your, your own yard or again in your community, you can look at some areas that are at particularly high risk. Um, newly established grass, areas of steep slope, um, places that maybe are being over irrigated, uh, high use areas, high traffic areas around uh, athletic fields or golf courses, um, anywhere that's close to a stream or body of water. Um, all of those areas are going to be the ones you're going to want to look at first when you want to look at better lawn care practices. Um, you can take a look if you're looking at an HOA scale. Um, take a look at your procurement contract. Do you have somebody that you're paying now to do your lawn, uh, your lawn care, your landscaping? Make sure that they are qualified and, and have an urban nutrient management plan in place so that they're not needlessly putting down fertilizer um, in places that maybe don't need it or they're not putting it too close to um, your streams and rivers. There are lots of good partners um, out there to help you with this. Master Gardeners, Soil Conservation Districts, um, you know, all kinds of resources, folks who are available, extension agencies um, who can help uh, come out and develop a plan for you, um, either on your own property um, or in your community. Um, and it's simple things. You know, you can put down usually half to a third of the rate of fertilizer that's on the label. Um, and that's just if you don't do a soil test. Uh, I always recommend doing a soil test to see if you even need nutrients. Um, a lot of uh, soils around here are pretty rich in phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times you don't even need it uh, at all. And it's, it's not doing anything other than washing off in your streams and rivers, um, you know, and, and never put it down outside of that sort of green up period. If, if everything is growing, it's okay. Uh, in the wintertime, the grass is unable to take that up. And it's not doing any good. You can set your mower heights a little bit higher. Those deeper root systems that you get with taller grass um, can help water infiltrate a little bit better, um, still not as good as a bioretention or a rain garden, but can help a little bit. It also makes it a little bit more um, weed resistant, believe it or not, keeping your grass a little bit taller. Um, making sure that fertilizer isn't going down your paved surfaces, and of course, never putting it down within 15 feet of your stream. Um, it's pretty much a direct conduit. Um, it's, it's important, you know, especially if you have these water features, a lot of HOAs have ponds, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, um, but if they have all these terrible algal blooms, um, they turn really green and nasty and they maybe start to smell bad. A lot of times it's just because there's too much fertilizer being applied in and around the neighborhood and it's washing down into the stormwater ponds and kind of fouling them up. So rather than going in dumping chemicals into your pond to clean them up, you can start at the application scale and reduce how much fertilizer you're putting down. I already mentioned trees, uh, how they're sort of undersold as a practice. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can get trees uh, into your community, street trees, 
um, just individual trees in your yard. If you have a big green space in your community, you can try to convert it to a, an urban forest area. Um, you know, and that's sort of planting at a specific density that helps you um, get to what you need uh, to maintain those forest-like conditions. You get habitat, you get the water quality benefits, the dense root networks, um, evapotranspiration, et cetera. Um, there are lots of things to consider if you're looking at planting trees. Um, there are a lot of habitat benefits of using native species. You wanna take a look at the site conditions. Um, is it a shadier area? Do you have the right kinds of soils? Um, you know, what are your space requirements? Are there power lines overhead that you need to avoid? Are there power lines underground that you need to avoid? Um, think about, you know, what the right places are to put your trees in. And then personal preference. Um, what seasonal interest do you want? Like, do you want to have a fruit tree in your yard or in your community? Um, that can be a really great way to kind of build support. Um, if you have something that becomes a community amenity, um, like a fruit tree, flowers, leaf color, bark, all really good things to consider. Um, this is a graphic uh, that I borrowed from a book from Doug Tallamy. Uh, this gets tossed around a lot from the folks that kind of do this work. Uh, these species provide tremendous habitat. Um, you know, your native trees, oak trees, and your native perennials um, are really great for promoting, you know, butterflies, insects, birds, and many others uh, in your neighborhood and in your community. Conservation landscaping, um, this is sort of the, you know, get rid of the turf, but maybe don't go full rain garden. Um, you can provide these native uh, meadow areas. You can do this in small areas in a, in a community on the hillside, um, really promote habitat. It's again, it's reducing the maintenance burden. Um, these are things that you, you can still probably come in and mow them maybe once to twice a year, uh, which helps to ease maintenance. So it makes it a little bit easier on you in terms of uh, maintaining them. Um, but they also provide better uh, runoff treatment because you do go in and amend the soils. Um, mulch can be an issue sometimes because it can float. It can clog up your rain garden. These conservation landscape areas generally don't have any mulch in them. So that can, can help sometimes as well. Um, there are all kinds of uh, super pro providers for habitat. These are some examples from a webcast um, that we did recently with HD Design Studio, which is down uh, in Dave's neck of the woods in Charlottesville. Things like goldenrod, sunflowers, joe pieweed, and aster um, provide tremendous habitat benefits and a lot of aesthetic interest as well. Um, really quickly, because I only have about three or four more minutes, I think, um, before we get to questions, thinking bigger. Uh, if you are interested in going on a, a larger scale type of renovation or retrofit in your community, this is not going to be for uh, the individual homeowners, but if folks want to kind of band together, seek a partner like Dave mentioned who can help you go and find uh, financial resources to take on this type of project. You can look at renovating or retrofitting your stormwater pond or detention basin. So a lot of communities are structured sort of like the one on the screen now. Um, you have sort of your development that all drains to a single large stormwater detention basin, stormwater pond. This is sort of the older design. Um, now we have more distributed practices like rain gardens and bioretention. Um, but this is sort of most communities designed between you know, the 70s and maybe the 90s have something like this. Um, renovating stormwater ponds can be really a, a great idea if you have the resources because they are, are great um, for reducing flood damage to local property and infrastructure. They can hold a tremendous amount of water. That was sort of their original design and purpose was really for flood control. Um, they also help with water quality. Um, that water drains down from the system. It can filter out uh, in that stormwater pond um, before it gets released in as cleaner water down into your local streams and rivers. It slows that flow down um, and it can really green up your local parks. You can make it a community amen an amenity. Um, geese, whether you like them or not, love them. Um, so depending on what you think about that, uh, it could be a, a plus or a minus. Um, but it's, it's a good way to make over something that maybe has become a bit of an eyesore in the community because a lot of them have these ponds. Um, and there's a lot of different things you can do with them. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because I do think it's going to be um, a less common option unless you've been approached by your county or municipality um, to tackle these types of projects. But you can do something like Dave mentioned. Um, you can turn the, the bottom of your detention basin into a bioretention or a rain garden. Uh, in the top left is sort of a, the lowest maintenance type of bioretention. They replace the soils, um, but they didn't do sort of a perennial planting. They did actually the turf grass planting along the basin. Um, you can convert it into a wetland, a stormwater wetland pond, uh, like in the top right. Uh, the bottom left, something called floating treatment wetlands. You can tether these little rafts 
to your um, the, the pond. They float on the surface there. They provide some habitat, and they actually help promote uh, sediment and nutrients uh, dropping down to the bottom of the pond. The plants can actually take up some of those nutrients as well. And then the bottom right, there are also designs um, where you can just extend the amount of water that can be held within those ponds um, to release the water a little bit more slowly, um, just increasing the capacity of, of your pond to sort of hold and treat that water for, for water quality purposes. So I'll just wrap up um, with this suburban watershed ethic. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can get involved in your community. Um, local planning is hugely important and a lot of times um, underappreciated. Uh, the amount of impervious surface in your community uh, has a tremendous impact on the quality of your water resources, um, especially your streams and rivers. Uh, it's documented over and over again that sometimes even as much as you do with your rain gardens and your other BMPs, you can never quite get back what is lost when you uh, pave over uh, an area. So if you have a local planning board and you can get involved, um, I encourage you to do that. Just be informed about local watershed issues. Attending webinars like this one um, is a great way. Reach out to your local uh, watershed uh, agencies or, or organizations, there are nonprofits covering tons of watersheds across the Chesapeake Bay region. Writing letters to your elected officials, uh, funding is super important. Right now in particular, funding is going to be targeted. Uh, make sure that environmental, uh, you know, priorities are still being taken care of. Just getting out in your, your watershed, taking a walk around, appreciating what you have, understanding what you have can really help you connect with the resources. Um, we've already talked about nutrient management and and watershed friendly yards. Um, so do that on a personal level. As Dave mentioned, uh, it'll inspire people who walk by and see your property to maybe do the same. Um, and then just express your stewardship in your daily consumer behavior. Think about your plastic, think about your, your carbon footprint, think about other things that you're doing just in your daily choices um, to try to make a difference um, and, and help other people um, with those decisions. So I apologize, I know that I talked quickly. Um, I wanted to leave you all an opportunity to ask questions and have discussion. There's lots of resources. Um, I have them at the back end of my slide deck. I know they're gonna be posted. Um, if you want more information on anything I talked about today, we probably have an hour long webcast on one of those topics somewhere in our archives. So um, I encourage you to check those out. And with that, I will be quiet and turn it back over to our uh, facilitators. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up the, the presentation today and then we're gonna go on to question and answer. Can you guys see my slides? Yes. Cool. So there's no denying that human beings have a profound impact on the landscape, but that impact can be negative or it can be positive, like we learned today. A shift in our stormwater management from hardened stormwater removal systems to green infrastructure that captures and utilizes rainwater to improve our common areas can help reduce environmental problems downstream. Our speakers have shared numerous tips to help you get started on a project in your community and ways to become more involved on this issue. First, I encourage you to review those tips and, and learn more on our resource page that we'll be sending out right after this, well, not right after, give us, give us a day <laughs> after this webinar. And we have all the resources that the presenters have mentioned on there. And we'll also have all of their presentations. Share your knowledge with your board of your HOA and other residents. Take the lead on a green infrastructure project in your common area and advocate for increased funding as, um, as David Wood mentioned, and I think Ari mentioned too, we need more funding for programs like the VCAP uh, funding in Virginia and other similar pro programs that might be present in other states. As speakers mentioned, many of these projects were funded through the VCAP pro program. And these funds were reduced this year to $500,000. Obviously that ran out um, in early 2020 because there's just so much interest and our legislators need to know how much interest and how much need there is for programs like this. And finally, take action at home. The best way to get your HOA interested is completing a project in a common area to show them an example of what it could look like on your own property. And start small, build upon it. It can be very effective for building uh, momentum in your community. Just do something simple like putting up bluebird boxes and you'll be amazed how many more people come out and say they wanna do something else. So with that, uh, Claire, would you like to lead us in question and answer? 
Yeah, thank you so much, Julie. And thank you for all of these uh, great presentations, um, Dave, Ari, and David. I also wanna say thank you to the folks that made it possible to have this webinar, especially our Northern Piedmont Community Foundation's Cortland Fund, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Fauquier County, Virginia Cooperative Extension, John Marshall Soil and Water District. So uh, again, a lot of those folks are here on the webinar, so I just wanted to give them a quick thank you. And now for the questions. I will kick it off with a question we got early on, and it's for Julie. So Julie, there are a lot of questions from HOA members that want to know how they can better manage natural areas like meadows and forests in their neighborhood. Uh, they talk about excessive mowing and destroying habitat for animals and they want to protect that habitat. Do you have some advice you can give to those landowners? Well, I mean, I would say keep learning. There's a lot of opportunities to protect your, um, to do innovative things in your woodlands. Uh, contact the Department of Forestry in your state and get advice from them on that. Also, um, if you have uh, meadowy era, era, areas that you don't want to see mowed, um, you know, start talking to the HOA about possibilities. Maybe hand out a couple copies of the bringing, oh, it's backwards, sorry, but bringing nature home book to, uh, your HOA members and start talking to them about, you know, how much more wildlife their children and they could see when they take a walk if they left a middle area of the field um, unmowed. And they can put up signage that warns about things like ticks because I know that's a major concern. I, I live in Leesburg and we have a great park that has a nice central area, but you walk, you can kind of zigzag through it and it has signage saying do not enter because of ticks, but it's beautiful to watch the butterflies and everything fluttering out in and out of that area. Great, thanks Julie. Um, yeah, there's a lot to learn about our native habitat and I did type the name of that book, Bringing Nature Home in the chat for those that might wanna pick it up. All right, another question um, that you know, I think we did a good job of, of mentioning a lot about the costs. So thank you um, to all the presenters who talked about the real costs associated. Um, people did ask though, you know, how can they at their HOA level uh, reach out to funders? You know, what's a good way to get started on figuring out how to organize a project and, and maybe apply for a grant? And I thought maybe Dave Hirschman, you could answer that question. Sure. Claire, and maybe I will give it a shot and kick it back to some of the other speakers as well, because we all have unique experiences in that regard. Uh, just to follow on what Julie said about HOA common area, um, a pet peeve I've had for many years is how they become dumping grounds for grass clippings and leaves, and that can really compromise the ecosystems we have in there. So that doesn't answer your question, Claire. I just thought I'd mention that that is an educational opportunity for HOAs, that common areas are not uh, dump, dumping grounds. Um, so funding, and I think we talked about the partnerships. Um, some of the funding sources are geared towards very small uh, entities, such as a homeowners association, and those would be more of your community foundations or your regional grant agencies. Uh, to scale up, if you have a bigger project in mind, the partnerships we talked about with watershed organizations is really the way to go. And it might be that uh, a, a watershed organization or, or even a local government would have an opportunity to bundle a couple projects together within an area uh, an HOA, maybe some businesses, a couple different neighborhoods. And when the projects scale up like that, there's other funding sources that become available. Um, some that come to mind are National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and also Chesapeake Bay Trust. Uh, but the funding comes and goes. Um, it's really, it's, there's people that are expert at it. If you're trying to ramp up, it quickly becomes overwhelming. So. I think as Ari said, you know, find your allies, ask around and, and find some help. I would just add on to that. Um, start out with your soil and water conservation district. I think David Wood mentioned that in his presentation. Um, they usually know ever, all the other players out there so they can get you started and make those connections for you. 
Thanks. Thanks, Julie and Dave. Um, I'm going to try and answer a question because I, I feel like I can do a good job. But a lot of people um, mention that, you know, as we see native plants, you know, growing tall um, or having meadows, that their HOA is concerned about ticks. Um, and also they're worried, you know, if they do rain gardens, they might have mosquitoes. Um, so a, a note about bugs. Um, I'll start with mosquitoes. So when you build um, rain gardens, you wanna see them draining within 24 to 48 hours. The time that it takes a mosquito to lay out larvae and for them to start hatching is in that 48 hour window. So we always want to design rain gardens, bioretention, anything of that nature to drain quickly and be absorbing without water into the roots of plants and very um, specifically, uh, spongy soil so that that water is not out in the open uh, making mosquito habitat. So I'll, I'll hopefully have answered that. Um, and ticks, you know, ticks are an issue um, and everyone knows that when you go in the woods and tall grass you'll find more of them. But ticks also are eaten by birds and other animals. So if you have a healthy ecosystem and your HOA does really um, take care of these uh, natural areas and allows for wildlife to use them. You will see, you know, birds and other animals eat ticks um, as part of the circle of life. Um, we just have to be patient and wait for that circle of life to really get going sometimes. All right, and I'll see if we can answer a couple more questions. We're getting close to the end. So let me read through one or two more here. We had a good question about for forested areas, and I'm not sure who, who should get this. <laughs> but landowners um, with forests in their yards are looking at how to manage invasive tree and shrub species. Um, and then also part two of that question is desirable trees, how can they be protected and, and enhanced in their neighborhood? Anyone wanna grab that one? What was the first part of that question again? I'm sorry. The second one was how do we take care of? Yeah, so caring for good, you know, desirable trees and also managing invasives in forested areas. Mm, both really complex issues. I will gladly cede to anyone else who wants to jump in. For me, it's going to be mostly pontification. I think David Wood was about to hop, hop on that one. Yeah, I just, <laughs> it is a complicated issue because unfortunately a lot of that uh, just takes some, you know, uh, dirty work in terms of getting in and, and managing the invasive species. I, I, you know, we keep kind of beating this drum, but one of the best things to do is to reach out to, you know, an extension agent or, or someone, you know, in your local you know, community or municipality who can help you with the identification of the uh, invasive species that you have. Um, and there are different uh, eradication methods that, you know, obviously we prefer to avoid, you know, chemical methods and things like that. It takes a lot more work to do it sort of at a, a hand um, tool type of scale, um, but it's something that a lot of times is sort of the, the default method for, for caring for some of those areas. Um, in terms of protecting what you have, um, you know, there are maintenance tips that you can go through if you're talking about sort of individual trees that you're taking care of, you know, avoiding planting, you know, uh, directly underneath of those trees, digging up where you can cause damage to the roots, um, you know, taking care of vines uh, if you start to see them um, on your trees, uh, doing pruning at the right times of year and in the right ways. Um, but there's also sort of the, the policy angle, which is, you know, working, um, in your locality to, you know, help promote uh, forest conservation ordinances and easements and sort of thinking about ways to protect larger intact stands of forest um, from future clearing from either development um, or other activities. So, you know, there's sort of that policy angle as well, um, which again, just sort of takes connecting with the right folks who are sort of working on those issues and, and adding your voice to that conversation. And just one thing I'm gonna add real quick, uh, for planting trees, it's one thing, but you're talking about caring for trees that are already there. Um, the mulch volcano, as I call it, or some people think that putting mulch around the base of a tree is beneficial. Well, it is if you do it right. Uh, if you just pile the mulch up against the base of the trunk, you're not doing that tree a service. You want a ring, a donut around the bottom to help hold the water there and keep stuff from growing. But the mulch volcano can actually hurt a tree. So, sorry for that aside. 
That's a great point. No, I, I appreciate that. All right, I have a, another question and um, going into the maintenance of conservation landscaping. Folks um, wanted to know if they thought, or if any of the presenters thought that traditional landscaping companies can handle the type of maintenance for special green infrastructure areas or other recommendations. I'll take a stab at that, Claire, because that's right up the alley of the program that several of us mentioned, the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional. Uh, there's a couple different levels of that program, and level one really focuses on maintenance of green infrastructure practices. So the people that have become certified through that program, and there's a directory on the website, uh, might be a good resource. and. If say an HOA really wants to move in that direction, uh, that it, they might suggest that the landscape contractor that they're already working with um, pursue that type of certification. It can be quite different. Um, there, we, we see a lot of things in traditional landscapes that we do not want to happen um, in native landscapes. So I, I think it's important to know what those differences are and the adaptive management in particular that needs to take place uh, to keep them being successful. Thanks, that's, that's great. Yeah, I'm glad we, we talked more about that program and um, that'll be in our resources, you know, as a link if, if folks wanna see more about that. Well, we are getting near the end. I think I can probably squeeze in one more question, um, but then we'll probably um, let you all go. Um, let's see. There was a question about how um, the, sorry. <laughs> how, can we track water quality on our stream in our neighborhood or at our retention pond? Um, one person asked if there were water quality monitors or probes or what were ways they could look at water quality in their neighborhood? Claire, I wanna throw that back to you because that's kind of what you do a lot with the, uh, some of our students and stuff. I mean, obviously John Marshall Soil and Water District goes out and there's a lot of watershed organizations, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> yeah, thanks for indulging me. Um, yeah, water quality is monitored in a lot of different ways at a lot of different levels. Um, an easy way to start looking at water quality, um, you can do simple tests, um, just, you know, pH kits or dissolved oxygen kits, um, a thermometer, read the temperature, a turbidity tube. These are really cheap and easily um, accessible tools. If you want, um, I can connect you with the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative who offers um, these resources to any individual or group that wants to do monitoring. Um, and I, you know, at Piedmont Environmental Council work with um, this Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative to even do chemical tests as well as these just basic kind of parameters. Further, um, if you have children and you want to look at water quality with kids, an even easier and really exciting way to look at water quality is counting macro invertebrates and seeing what type of bugs are in your creek. Uh, they are harmless. These bugs are easy to pick up and uh, will tell you if you know you've got water that's pollution, you know, heavy or maybe more tolerant um, species can be there. So um, that's one way you can see if they're you know what type of pollution um, levels might be in your creek by just knowing what the bug species are. And that's through the Isaac Walton League of America. And again, we can put that in our resources. They have a lot of information about how to monitor for macro invertebrates. Oh, and someone just told me the Critter Creek app is a great way to get people engaged. So I don't know about that, so I'll have to look at that too. Yeah, I've got that one. It's actually pretty neat. So real quickly before we, we completely um, uh, close off the webinar, I did wanna just again say that the organizations we have presenting here today are great places to start uh, uh, your um, 
your learning experience about these, um, these, the resources that are out there. So PEC has some upcoming HOA um, forums in Loudoun County. There's gonna be one coming up, so look for that. Go to our PEC webpage. We also do a sustainable landscaping workshop here in Fauquier County, so that'll be coming up. And the Chesapeake Stormwater Network has a ton of resources, which we will be putting up on that resource page. And I encourage you to sign up. I signed up for their, um, their emails that they sent out. They are very informative, very helpful. Dave Hirschman also has a blog that he sends out regularly. And then the Center for Watershed Protection, Ari Daniels, they have some great resources that you should definitely check out. And that will all be on that resource page.